Welcome to another episode of We Are Carbon. I'm Helen Fisher and I'm joined by Adrian Ferrero, CEO of Biomakers, to take a more detailed look at the role of microbial communities within soil. Biomakers bring the world of computing technology and DNA sequencing to soil life. When we talk about regenerative agriculture, we can often lean on words like traditional and indigenous, which generally gives the sense that we're turning our back on modern developments in technology. But of course, the very best value comes when we can learn to integrate points of view together. We need to continue to look forward, and our logical, data-driven mind can add so much to that picture when it's brought in alongside the wisdom of working with nature. And there's perhaps never been a more important time to combine the two. With rapidly increasing fertiliser prices, more and more farmers are going to feel pressed to look for alternative approaches to their land. It's making regenerative methods increasingly desirable. But that doesn't mean that the transition is easy. By gathering a digital record of the biology and soil across different global locations and situations, Biomakers are building a database of knowledge and identifying patterns that are allowing that shift away from chemical inputs to become much more accessible. It's a really fascinating and expansive topic that's rapidly evolving. So I hope you'll enjoy learning about the potential of all of this as Adrian shares so many insights throughout this talk about how the data is shedding light on the functioning of microbial diversity and their relationships with plants and how that data can then guide actionable steps that's aiding farmers through challenges, from the broad to the very specific. You can of course keep up to date with everything from We Are Carbon by subscribing over on the website, wearecarbon.earth, or find us on Instagram, at wearecarbon.earth. Right, let's get stuck in. Welcome, Adrian. Thank you so very much for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking the time out and having this discussion with us. Um, you're the, the co-founder of Biomakers, and this is a, it's a fantastic opportunity for us to take a deeper look at what's actually going on deep within the soil from a very scientific, very microscopic close-up um, analysis point of view and I'm very excited to, to get stuck in and learn more about that. Before we go really deep into what your work is and what you cover, if you could just give us a brief introduction to yourself um, and a background, that would be fantastic. So hi Helen, pleasure for me to be here and contribute with my insights on everything that we are doing. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Biomakers. Uh, I'm an economist myself, uh, working in innovation for many years, and I decided to join my childhood friend, Alberto Acedo, to run business together. And the first company we set up was uh, the first genetic diagnostic center focused in human diseases, specializing in DNA sequencing, which is a new technology, a new way to digitalize the DNA. And we were quite successful with that company. And then we decided to apply the same approach into the agriculture. As I mentioned, originally from Spain, by, but biomakers born in California, in, in the Bay Area. Uh, that was 2015, the first time we, well, we registered the company. And right now we're a team of 70 people. We have over 1,500 clients, uh, two processing labs, for uh, soil samples, and also we have partner labs all across the world. I don't know if that's enough or if there is any specific question beyond this. No, that's fantastic. Thank you. And it sounds incredibly technical, very scientific. And this is um, what is unique, I think, about the, the perspective that you can offer to us. Because we're sort of understanding this from a broader point of view um you know the audience is going to be very varied here but we're we're not necessarily scientists i would absolutely love it if you could answer the question um about carbon sequestered into soil so how does carbon get sequestered into soil from a more layman's point of view 
Yeah, that's an amazing question and really trending topic right now because everybody is talking about carbon uh, sequestration and especially in connection with the agriculture, uh, how carbon can be storage into, into the soil. So let me just uh, step back a little bit and provide a mo little bit more background on the technology that we have developed that will give some perspective on our approach or how we look at the, at the soil. Because the way we look at the soil uh, as a startup, what we realized is that there was a, a need in agriculture to have reliable bio indicators, biomarkers. Uh, at the end of the day, farmers were not making decisions based on um, biological processes happening in the soil. Most of the farming decisions were based on, well, physical chemical parameters, which, I mean, those are the data sets that are very interesting. But if we talk about a biological activity, which is plant growth, we should also keep in consideration what is happening in, in the field overall. So in the soil, we, we find a perfect bioindicator, a perfect biomarker that impact the way plant grows. So there are different dimensions this, the soil is impacting the plants. On one hand, uh, how the soil is feeding or allowing the plant to be fed in the same way that our gut microbiome is helping us to digest the food that we eat. In the soil, there are microbes that help plants to suck or to collect the, the different nutrients. At the same time, the resistance to different diseases or the risk of having different disease uh, is happening also in the soil. There is a reflection. So with this idea in our head, what we did is to develop a technology that, was, that is able to really identify all the metabolic pathways, all the bioactivities happening in the soil and also to measure them. And it's the first time we're able to see uh, this, this data at, uh, at the level of detail that we are able to provide. The impact for farmers at the end of the day is that they can really connect to the soil biology, to partner with the soil biology, to enhance those processes and to benefit from the processes instead of just assuming that those processes are there and are going to happen. Now we can drive those processes. Now coming back to your question, now related to carbon. So uh, in the soil, there is also a respiration processes and there is a lot of exchange on carbon. On one hand, there is carbon release and there is also carbon capture because of the biological activity of the soil. Plants also, let's say, uh, extract carbon and turn it into vegetal biomass. And this is what we have traditionally considered carbon sequestration in, in forests or in the field. But there are other uh, dimensions that has been uh, forgotten, which is what is happening underground, the biomass that the soil has. There is one measure that has been traditionally used to measure the, the carbon in the soil, which is SOC, the organic carbon in the soil. And, and what we can see is that there are a tremendous chains from field to field. Uh, there is also some variability. So, of course, there is carbon sequestration in the soil, especially thinking about human activities, agriculture. There could be carbon sequestration or there could be carbon release. This is the question. Traditionally, if we think about the latest 40 years, the way we have been farming, actually what we have done is to release carbon. It's, it hasn't been like carbon uh, friendly activity. Also because the technologies and the goals and you know the approach of farm of farming was not really focusing or targeting um, sustainability. It was really targeting increasing the yield as much as possible. Now we're in a moment where agriculture is transitioning into a new model where yield is important for sure. We need to feed the planet. We need to provide crops. We need to make agricultural activity sustainable from the economic point of view as well. But at the same time, we can help uh, to support the sustainability of the planet. If we turn from a carbon uh, intensive farming into a carbon friendly farming, keep in mind that agriculture is responsible of 10% of the carbon emissions. So there is this double effect. On one hand, we stop releasing carbon 
from the agricultural activity, and on the other, side, uh, on the other hand, we start compensating this, uh, this impact by sequestering carbon. And this could also bring revenues to farmers, which is very interesting. Yes, so when you mean revenues from the carbon itself, you mean from a like, carbon credit point of view? Yes, exactly. And there are some examples already in some parts in the world, for instance, in US, where some farmers have benefited from turning into more carbon friendly practices. But still, there are so many questions related to carbon credits that we need to solve. Uh, we're a science based company. Everything we develop has to be technically validated. So if you think about the mechanism, the current mechanism that we have today to measure the, the carbon uh, the sequestration, so the level of carbon sequestration, well, most of, of the models are estimations. So probably we could do better. Um, for instance, Biomakers is already working in defining a, a new way to measure this uh, by looking at the carbon by activity, carbon pathway. So what is the, let's say the soil is like a box and that box have a, a capacity, thinking about carbon, okay? And what happened in that box is on us. Depending on the human intervention, the intensity of the farming practices, we can be fulfilling the box with carbon or releasing not the, the box with uh, carbon. An example, uh, if we look at the organic matter in, in a forest, the carbon, the organic matter, or the, which is at the end the, the carbon that we can measure into the soil, is around five to 6%. In the moment you turn, like forest land into agricultural land, organic matter goes down to 0.52% max. So all the carbon that you had previously in the box have been already released. That's what has happened in the past, in the last 40 years mainly. Now we're developing strategies to fulfill the box by changing or let's say evolving the farming practices. And the great thing is that we can move from what I mentioned, 0 0.5, 1.5% organic matter up to 3, 4%. This is going to have an amazing impact in, in climate change, for sure. Yeah, that sounds like an incredible increase. And um, when we think about how much land is dedicated to agriculture, if we did that across the board, that would be a lot of carbon being put into that box. With regards to the activities that release it, is that the very destructive um, physical activities along with chemical inputs? Are they both combined um, to contribute towards emptying the box, so to speak? Yes. Well, if you think about the overall uh, agricultural activity, there are different uh, dimensions where we are releasing carbon. I mean, uh, yes, using a specific equipment into the field is going to be very energetic demanded. So meaning that we are going to have carbon emissions uh, from yeah, the use of um, tractors or the energy that you are using in the field. So that's emission. If you stop doing, for instance, uh, tilling in a field, you straight uh, directly uh, stop uh, emitting as much carbon as previously. On the other hand, if you protect the land, the soil, and keep this base, uh, the cover base of the soil, then uh, you favor the maintenance of the organic matter as well. So yeah, there are different ways that, well, we are impacting the carbon in both directions, depending on the farming practices that we, we develop in the field. Yeah, and in terms of drawing it down and drawing it down um, back into the box as quickly as possible, we would want to support as many of those aspects as possible that are beneficial and move things in that direction. Is that um, hugely dependent upon the biological life within there? Yes, and the good thing is that we are moving or transitioning into greener farming. Uh, the use of uh, biological inputs, it's, it's bigger every day. There are new solutions that farmers have available in their uh, input stores, in the retailers. And instead of using chemical or synthesized fertilizers, they can go into different solutions that are going to benefit, for instance, the carbon sequestration, for sure. 
So this is, uh, for instance, one of the dimensions that uh, we can consider. Also, there is this movement that is not really actually small, it's, it's growing very quick and more and more farmers and also corporations are embracing it, which is called regenerative agriculture. It's kind of way of approaching agriculture and uh, it's really focusing on benefiting the biological processes in the field and at the same time it's called carbon farming or carbon friendly farming because it's going to increase the, the sequestration of the carbon that uh, we have again turning from carbon emitting activity into carbon sequestering activity so talking about agriculture so regenerative agriculture for sure they are doing so many trials so many experiments so many you know testing different techniques uh, now a cover crop now i'm going to use this uh, machine that is not going to till it's just going to put the plant underground without breaking the layer so there uh, syntropic agriculture is another uh, experiment mixing different crops in the same field that uh, they have symbiotic relationships so they help each other to grow better uh, faster and better no? and then you have uh, crops that have also well, from the flavor and the qualitative point of view a uh, really huge i mean really good characteristics so yeah, there are many uh, techniques that you can be doing that farmers are testing and uh, what we and companies as biomakers, we are helping them to measure and to track what is happening in the field. Okay, fantastic. And one of the largest um, contrasts that I can see between conventional farming and regenerative farming is like you said at the start of this, the convention is to look at the chemistry and therefore we're putting inputs into the soil that are synthesized. And that would be for fertilization and pest control and um, all of the um, working aspects that the, the plants need to grow. In the regenerative model, it's, it's more that we're turning our back on that and saying that potentially those chemicals are actually doing more harm than they are good. So we're replacing the chemical inputs with biological understanding and biological um, support of the, the whole system. And within this, it's, it seems like an enormous contrast. And I think that it's, it's very, very um, exciting because we can see how that, uh, when we sort of zoom out from that normal mindset of seeing this this tract is constantly plowing through fields and spraying chemicals everywhere that's just, they look horrible, the ground looks dead, but this is how we're sort of growing our food. When we, when we switch that around, well, you, can, you can see, like you've mentioned, cover crops and that the soil is more alive and the actual farm itself is looking more green and alive more of the time with more insects and um basically what we you would consider to be somewhere that you would want to be uh, you know what you would consider to be natural and beautiful and all of that that we see on the top of the soil so whether that's insects flying around or that's um, green cover crops and flowers and fragrance and birds there is the diversity under the soil also that we can't see but presumably the more that the life is sort of expanding and growing and flourishing on top of the soil, the more that that is also happening underneath, that that's a kind of hand in hand. And we can't see all of that life under there, so it's easy for us to ignore what's going on, but you can, in your work, you have a great understanding of that. Is this about diversity of microbes doing all different roles in a community? Yeah, well, uh, what happened uh, underground and, or, or, how you say, overground, no, uh, in the surface is connected. So what you see probably in the surface is what is happening also underground. It's really unlikely, or that at least our data shows that, that if you see a really green area, uh, let's say, live field, no? Uh, it's unlikely that the underground life is going to be low or poor. Usually those are connected. But uh, as you mentioned, it's not just about uh, biodiversity. It's about having the right biodiversity. Uh, we're talking about an uh, economic activity. I mean, plant growth is the oldest human activity and we need to keep doing that. So 
if we if we want to feed a growing population, we need to have really high yields. But it's, the question is, is it possible to do that in a way that it's sustainable or environmentally friendly? No, uh, for sure. And you just hit the, the point. It's about the biodiversity that you have and how specialized this community of microbes is to really help or support the growth of uh, the growth of the crops of the plants and there uh, we have a huge margin previously we didn't have any idea now we can deliver very uh, precise insights on what is happening underground and by understanding this community this network of microbes that is fully connected and understanding their relationships their ecology then we can start playing or driving this community into a productive model that at the same time is really resilient, is really resistant, is really diverse and also help us to uh, protect overall the plants. Uh, holistic agriculture pointed out that it's not just about uh, growing the plants because if you... One thing that we need to start doing is uh, stop demonizing the, the conventional farmers. I mean, if we think on the technology available like 30 years ago, or we think about the, the pressure that the farmer is receiving to really deliver a grain or fruit into the market, well, at the end of the day, what they did was the best they could do according to the available techniques with the available data, and they took decisions based on that. Reality is that and here we have a double effect on why everything is evolving. Now we have new data sets, we have new technologies, we have better understanding, and now we can control what we were not able to control before. So before it was more like, I cannot control that, so I put that dimension aside and go into the dimension that I can control. And that's the reason because we started to really uh, do more like chemical-based agriculture. Everything was on track, everything was uh, under control, and from time to time, well, you have some side problems, but because you were throwing uh, crop protection inputs together with uh, chem chemical fertilizers, you knew that the plants were going to grow. That model worked in that time. Now is not the model we need to uh, pursue or to continue because it's not sustainable. It's really like uh, terminating the life of the soil and this is having an impact. In the last 40 years, we have lost one third of the arable soil globally because of those practices, meaning that, well, we got really high yields in the field, but uh, at the same time, we drain the, the soil uh, to a limit that we lose the fertility of the soil. Okay, lesson learned. What is happening now? There are new technologies, new knowledge, and at the same time, there is a a high, really high cost of chemical fertilizers. If you see the, the cost of area, for instance, which is one of the main fertilizers that is being used in agriculture, well, uh, it's like uh, five times uh, higher the price than, let's say, 12, 10, 10 months ago. Meaning farmers cannot afford the, to spend the same money in fertilizers, that's great. I mean, that's great, you know, not everybody will agree with that, but from our perspective and in, in the topic that we are considering here, that's great because they need to really rethink what they are doing in the field to make it more smartly and also the efficiency of those chemical fertilizer were really low. If you think that if you throw a pound of whatever MPK or whatever other nutrient uh, is, only 30% of that pound will go into the plant and 70% uh, will just be destroyed, released, you know, disappear or probably pollute the water, or, you know, have side effects. So increasing the fertility efficiency is going to be great to man save money for farmers and to increase the biological activity of the soil and preserve the fertility of the soil. So yeah, those, the, the, all, all these so let's say this momentum is uh, bringing the farmer to a situation where they need to really make experiment into regenerative agriculture, 
turning into other practices. And now we are able to share the knowledge because we are in the data society. So that's great because uh, the information just fly at a great speed. So we don't need to, to really make experiments place to place to learn. If somebody make an experiment in one region of the world, the rest of the world can learn from that. So yeah, I, I, I'm very optimistic on, on the momentum of agriculture, as you can see. Yeah, and I think having that incredible economic motivation where actually it's not becoming or it's becoming less and less viable every year to use the conventional methods because not only is the soil less productive, but the inputs are becoming more and more expensive. You said five times as much. That's it, It's clearly um, the biggest motivation of them all is to make money ultimately in any business. And if that is moving towards regenerative agriculture as being the most viable option for the future, then I think that's very optimistic that we'll combine all of these different motivations, both the climate and the environmental benefits with the business model benefits that, yeah, we should we should really start seeing um, huge transformation um, globally, I think, um, over the, the coming years. And that's very exciting and you're incredibly well placed um, to see exactly how this is going because I think that you, you've kind of hit it very well that people are moving from one practice that is incredibly prescriptive that they have been used to that this, this is what they've been trained in this is what they have depended upon and then to move from that to something that actually it's very difficult to give a prescription of put this on the soil and that is what the outcome will be it's the complete opposite. It has no guidelines. It has, um, or previous to having a very in-depth understanding. There's there's a lot of um, wait and see, I suppose. There's a lot of faith that farm farmers have to put into changing to these new methods. So you're bridging that gap um, with the technology and with the data that you're able to provide. Can the microbes and the biological approach support the farmers in all of those different areas. So say, for example, pest control. Can the soil life support the plants with pest control to replace chemical inputs that would just be to wipe out um, any problem that would be there? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> there is no other way to answer that question. We have plenty of examples where the the final recommendation based on our analysis is don't do anything. You don't need to throw anything to apply anything. You have everything over there. So yes, uh, be sure you care for the land in the way you are doing, but you, you don't need to spray because you have been spraying for the last year. So you still have it there. What you need is to unlock the mechanism, the biological mechanism, the mi microbes. Because at the end of the day, when we talk about the soil life, we're talking about the microbes. Uh, those are the ones really playing a role in all the bioactivities happening in the soil from different dimensions, no? But uh, yes, uh, microbes are, are essential. Uh, we have all, some examples. Uh, some farmers came, well, actually the agronomists came to us and telling like, hey, I've done the traditional soil test, the physical chemical test. I see that the amount of phosphorus and potassium in that field is huge. But when I see the plant performance is really low, so the green leaves are not as nice as I, I would like, and I don't know what to do. So that's an, a really recurrent question that we receive, not specifically on the phosphorus potassium, but actually this is one of the most frequent ones. So when we do the analysis, what we see is that the, the, the metabolic pathway, the, the, the mobilization of those specific nutrients are blocked, meaning the microbial community is not helping those nutrients to be released uh, to the plant. So what they need to do is to really unlock that uh, pathway, that mechanism. And uh, as I mentioned before, there is a new generation of solutions available. Still, there is certain uncertainty, certain uncertainty about the real effect of those solutions. But this is what we are also helping people to do, really to know what what is the impact of the specific solutions that are available that are going to help? Because if you have a, a, a balanced community of microbes, those microbes are going to help the plant to be fit. At the same time, those microbes are going to protect the plant. 
and because they are going to keep the balance on, on the community. I, I really love this example, and this is something we really perceive. If I ask you, where is the place where you could get an infectious disease that you will die? For sure, or well, probably. <laughs> You will be surprised that is the place where you have the lowest biodiversity, which is a hospital. If you get an infectious bacteria in a hospital, because that means that that bacteria is extremely resistant to any antibiotic that is available into the market. So then you have a big problem, right? And there you see the, the community impact. When you have other community that is more balanced, you might have pathogens, but th those pathogens are not going to be able to flourish and to create problems in the same way that if you go into a hospital. So having more diverse and balanced community of microbes in the soil, meaning having more balanced life in the soil, is going to be very positive for the plant and it is going to prevent a lot of headaches for, for the farmers. Yes, that's that's very interesting. So essentially, if we imagine sterilizing, we're not really sterilizing, we're just sort of depleting the biodiversity. And therefore, yeah. we're taking away all the resilience and all of that available community to to kind of come in and hold back. So the only thing that survives the um, antibiotics and the, um, uh, yeah, the chemicals, the only thing that survives is too strong and there's not enough to, to balance it out again. So that's what we've done to the soil, essentially. Um, reduced communities down to um, maybe just, just some very resistant varieties. Yeah, let me just uh, point it or specify that statement because we have done it because we didn't know much about the situation. Because, uh, and don't take me wrong, it's not about having the pure life in the soil. Again, this is an economic activity. Of course, uh, we want farmers to be profitable, to enjoy their life. I mean, they're really putting a lot of efforts, a lot of energy to, to grow plants, to grow pro crops, and they need to benefit out of that. At the same time, we need uh, the crops to get into the market, to feed the planet. And uh, of course, we, land is so important. We want this to be sustainable because otherwise, yeah, the future is not as, as, as clear. But um, let me just give you another example related to human health. I think those are really matching this, this question. So uh, if you have a headache, you don't go to a chemotherapy process. But if you have a cancer, then probably you need to go through a chemotherapy because otherwise you are done. So this is what is happening. Understanding what is the problem that you are having, the risk that you are having, probably uh, helps you to adjust the, the treatment or the decision. No? And this is what has been missing in, in the field. Uh, people have been using, using uh, massive weapons when probably they have really little problem. And that had a really side effect, and that hasn't been very good, negative side effect. But now uh, the situation is a little bit different, and uh, we're learning. And everybody is becoming a data geek. I mean, we say we are data geeks because we are a startup, but if you think about everybody with a smartphone, they, they process data every day in, in all kind of dimensions of life. If you want to do a... a purchase and e-commerce uh, for anything, probably you are going to look for different sites, compare, so you are going to get a lot of data. And farming community is pretty much the same. And they are also aware of the, uh, the, the importance or the relevance of uh, climate change because it's impacting them dearly. And uh, they know the opportunity they have with carbon credits that still needs to be a little bit more developed to be more trustable, more reliable as a market, not so volatile. Um, no? so, but uh, they know that there is an opportunity. So think about this. We're telling the farmers, if you transition for certain practices into other practices, beyond the impact in your agriculture and the, the assets, the productive asset that is the soil, is going to be very beneficial. Uh, we are going to pay you because you are sequestering carbon instead of emitting carbon or releasing carbon. This is a very interesting message that is going to capture the attention from many of 
the farmers. Yes, absolutely. I can imagine it will um, because it, it's giving such um, support for their work and encouragement to to both look after the environment and look after their pocket, which as you've um, just mentioned just now about the, the inputs being proportionate to the problem, whether that's a human health or the soil itself. And of course, when it comes to a business, you don't want to be throwing in waste pro you know you're just throwing good products but wasting them because they're not needed then it is incredibly beneficial to have the data to to say what is needed and what is just going to be um excess and to cut back so regarding the um information and the data that you can provide for people is that basically what um is at the heart of it is giving them the information that's needed to have just the right activity just the right action and input into the soil. Exactly, uh, but this is a learning process. Uh, let me share with you why. Because we are uh, opening this new dimension, this new layer of data, and it's, uh, we're working with the community to understand how to use the data for, for better. And we started seven years ago, and we have done an amazing path. And uh, we found amazing people in between really uh, open to contribute to, to this goal. The moment where we are right now is that we have really good understanding on what are the actions based on, let's see, uh, the, 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 the functional profile of a field. Just by looking at what is the current status, we can really see what are the actions that you have to, to do. What we are working internally as a company is also to connect what is the, let's say, the diagnosis with the solution. So we work with retailers and farmers on looking at different fields, you know, understanding and connecting different layers of data from soil structure to the yield to the functional profile of the soil, which is what we provide. And uh, on the other hand, we're working with input manufacturers, uh, mainly developing or uh, offering biological solutions on understanding the impact and the effectivity patterns of those inputs, because this is going to help them to improve their solutions, to make those solutions more effective, and also to understand what are the, let, let me say, the functional claims that they can present in the market to differentiate, because that's a huge problem. When we talk about biologicals, it's like a package, no? it's a, a bag, and there are many products there, but all of them are different. Uh, the problem is that we didn't have the tool to really understand what are the specific differences. That, now we have it. And if you have those data points, you can connect them by applying artificial intelligence uh, because you can model the behavior of the different solutions and you can predict if that solution is going to work in a specific field and how this solution is going to work with a really high um, comfort, you know, like uh, significance, in talking about probabilities. So uh, this is what we are working and is something that is going to be available not far in the time, but this is something we are building right now. Wonderful. And in terms of biological inputs, what we're talking about here is actually inoculating the soil with um, microbes. We are talking about all kinds of inputs because uh, yeah, for us, soil is the biomarker, but everything happening in the field is going to impact the soil. Uh, it's one of the inputs, and this, this is a really interesting uh, example. Uh, we're working with a manufacturer, and it's a foliar application. You put the, the solution into the plant, but we could see the impact of that solution into the soil. That was curious, right? The, the, pro, the, the challenge for us is the resolution, how we, let's say, turn the machine to really understand the, those changes. But this is what... Uh, excite us no? as, as uh, uh, technology developers. Uh, so, so it's not just about uh, the soil, it's about every, any input that you put because the soil is going to, to reflect it. Yes, okay, so there's, there's a variety of solutions. And do the, how, how do you go about, do you test the soil itself or are you testing the, the produce that the soil's um, growing um, to see what's lacking? Yeah, we, we uh, soil testing, we test the soil because we want to profile the community of microbes in that field. And the way we test the soil is not just by picking one single point, 
you collect different uh, spoonfuls of soil from different places, something between two and four inches deep, right? Uh, because that's where you will find the community, the reservoir of microbes that will give us uh, the most meaningful uh, community of microbes, let's say, that will give us multidimensional uh, information on what's happening in that field. So uh, what happened on the soil is that we received the soil in our lab and we just digitalized the biology of the soil. What is really interesting is what happens once you have the data. So once you have, and we look at the microbes from a DNA point of view, so we can profile all of them, the known and the unknown, which is, well, you can imagine, yes, uh, uh, we have right now in our database, we have identified so far with all the samples that we have processed from different crops, different locations, up to around 10 million different taxonomic units, meaning different microbes, but humans have been able to name just half million of microbes together bacteria and fungal species, like 350,000 bacteria and 150,000 a fungal species with name. So we have 10 million. You can imagine how far we are there. But uh, not knowing the name doesn't mean that we don't we know what they could potentially do. Because by looking at the DNA, we can make taxonomic uh, 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 affiliations. No? So you know that you have um, a plant or you have a mammal. No, you don't know the name of the plant, but you know that most of the plants do the photosynthesis. So meaning that that plant probably will do photosynthesis. No, that's the kind of intelligence that we build to, to, to make these functional profiles. Too many information, too much information. No, right? I think it's fabulous. It's very exciting. <laughs> um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of creating so many questions, but, um, yeah, really, really interesting information. And so you must be with every sample that's going through your um, DNA testing, you must be identifying new microbes with pretty much every spoonful of soil that you receive, I imagine. That's right. Um, we receive soil right now uh, for over 40 countries all across the world, 130 different crops. So we can say without question at this moment that we have the largest uh, soil microbiome database in the world. So yeah, we have pretty good understanding how the, the soil profiles at biological level looks like. And we really like that. And this also helped us to start doing some experiments. And let me just uh, connect with the carbon. We are doing one project together with other two companies in Peru. Uh, and we are helping them to understand how to turn desert soil into arable soil. And this is amazing because you just need to understand the biological mechanism to really boost the, the biological activity and the organic matter fixation and uh, they, this company has successfully turned desert soil into a citrus field and uh, it's currently a productive field so this field is, is producing lemons in, in Peru so this kind of actions give us a lot of expectation on uh, if we understand properly what is happening underground we can really we have an engineering a new engineering tool to to really shape the soil or drive the soil uh, in the way we need and when i say we need means in a productive way and also fulfilling all the environmental functions that uh, we need the soil to fulfill yeah this is so so very exciting when we talked about earlier you mentioned we've lost a third of the growing land and the the soil yes. has died and this is the last sort of 40 years we have gone in the direction of depleting everything. So to say we can take a desert and turn that into growing space, that gives the optimism that we could do that anywhere. Wherever soil has been depleted, we can transform that back into fertile growing land, which is exactly what we need and really gives so much hope. Is it a case of you starting to see patterns when you take the soil samples and you profile it? Can you look at a profile of soil and start to identify this is lacking and 
then on a very simplistic point of view, you can identify what's lacking and then put that back in there. Mm. Actually, uh, what we see usually, and this is something that our system is already able to, to provide us, is a connection between the farming practices and the soil profile. Human intervention is the highest uh, factor uh, impacting the, the soil status. So whatever you do in the field, the soil is going to reflect it. And this is something that was beyond looking like crop uh, specific patterns that can change because if you put a seed, a new seed in the field, suddenly that community, that soil is going to start changing and adapting to the new seed, to the new situation. Many people at the beginning especially came to us asking, can you tell me what is the most suit suitable crop in this field? Uh, we were working on that question and realized, well, this is not the way we need to approach this because uh, the, the decision of putting a crop or other in a specific field does not depend mainly on, on the biological status because that, that is going to evolve and adapt depending on the crop that you want to, to put there. So any crop can be grown. Okay, so actually the community within the soil is very dynamic and it will change to the crops themselves. So they are um, creating a relationship with that. And I suppose what would be really interesting is if we could really, when we talk about chemicals being fed to a plant, we're giving very specific nitrogen or potassium to the plant itself. When we talk about feeding plants with microbes, that network is actually interacting with the plant. So they are, uh, you, you've mentioned things like the pathways that they have for potassium or for phosphorus. And the microbes are, they're, they're almost like little factory workers, if, if I really excessively oversimplify. And they're, they're under there and they've each got a little role. So the, is it a case of the, the, the more varied that community is, the more resilient that the, the soil is in regards to providing plants with every single need that they've got? Hmm. Wow. <laughs> yes. So uh, as for clarification, when we put a biological, meaning a probiotic or prebiotic in the field, in the same way, when we eat a probiotic, we are feeding ourselves or let's say inoculating ourselves with microbes that will fulfill a specific function, okay, especially related to gut microbiome. Now we have so many creams that are probiotics, meaning that have active microbes, okay, that will stick in our skin and will create some protection or whatever uh, effect we, we are looking for. The prebiotics are molecules that are going to help uh, certain groups of microbes to flourish, meaning that you might have a pre prebiotic, you are not having active microbes in your body, but uh, probably you are going to uh, benefit certain groups of microbes in your guts. So in, in the field, it's pretty much the same, prebiotics and probiotics for the field. The goal of all of them is really stimulate the plant microbiome, everything that is around the plant and especially on the rootstock area, no? because those are the ones that are going to have a closer impact to what is happening in the plant also. And it, well, this is, uh, there are different dimensions, no? but also the, the microbes in, in the plant itself it, are going to protect the plant because they are going to occupy, to, to fulfill an ecological niche that probably other negative microbes or pathogens or any other microbe, undesirable microbe is not going to be able to flourish because they already have these other microbes. So yeah, uh, at the end of the day, what happens is that uh, there are different mechanisms, different techniques that uh, are available and depending what are the needs, what are the questions, what are the requirements uh, from the agronomic perspective for a specific field, then we will use one community or another. Sometimes it's not about adding more, for sure. As I mentioned before, the balance of the community is going to be great. What we know is that a community that is more diverse is going to compensate all the risks in a better way. So we can connect with the resilience concept. So yes, uh, but you don't want the most diverse community because probably is not the most specialized or efficient community for your plants. 
I know this is tricky, but uh, yeah, that's no, that 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 makes sense. So there's um, there's almost like specifics for specific crops. They are um, they're, they're creating their own community that's not necessarily the most diverse, but is the most suited to to yes. that um, yeah situation. The most suited, I, I like that. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you want to you want to have the microbes that the plan uh, that are going to help the plant in different dimensions. When I say different dimensions, I talk about uh, diseases for sure. So resistance to diseases or uh, reducing the risk of diseases, uh, stress, adaptation. So anytime you have like uh, hydric stress, salinity stress, or so all different stresses and um, hormone production, this is going to help the plant also to grow bigger and faster and then nutritional pathways, so how the plant is feeding. Uh, but not only the, the direct uh, nutrients or the major nutrients like carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, also minor nutrients, because in certain crops, for instance, if you enable the zinc pathway, what you are doing is increasing the resistance of the plant against certain diseases. This is happening in banana, for instance. So, yeah, you want to really unlock certain mechanisms and depending on the crop, you will push some or others. Now we have that knowledge. We know which communities are going to be connected to the mobilization of zinc or others. And the good thing is that there are certain solutions, these probiotics or prebiotics, that mainly biostimulants, that's like the group of them, that are going to, to help the plant for, for all of these dimensions at once. Fantastic. And when we think of uh, conventional inputs, we, we've heard that they tend to be needed to be increased year on year or the price goes up year on year. When we're talking about biological inputs, would it be correct to, um, to think that this is actually going to be the opposite um, or, or we'll find a point where it becomes the opposite because the input does not need to be continued? Mm -hmm. Well, the reason because the chemical inputs are rising, the prices are rising so greatly right now is because of the logistic problems that are happening globally right now because of the COVID, but at the same time because the energetic crisis. So gas is the main input to produce uh, nitrogen, for instance, which is one of the fertilizers. So uh, biological inputs have a different, completely different uh, production process. Usually, most of the input manufacturers use bio factories. So they have a bioreactor or a fermenter, and uh, pr the prices are going to be more stable from that point of view, no? because at the end of the day, you have your, your microbes, your culture that you need to grow. And out of that, you extract the, the concentrated, um, well, it could be any kind of, um, of media, but a liquid or a, a lung or like soil, no, the solid media, and then they, they will deliver the solution. So because the manufacturing process is a little bit different, it's expected that the prices will be more stable. And as competition uh, rise, uh, probably prices will go down and the productive process will be a specialist will probably will bring the cost, the production cost down. So this is going to benefit the, the farmer. My expectation, and this is going to be a huge market uh, on, on agriculture, the input, the biological inputs, but uh, from the farmer perspective, it's going to be very stable and very like secure, more than the chemical fertilizers, for sure. Certainly. Wonderful. And the work that you're doing at the current time, you're offering incredible data analysis and therefore actionable um, advice that, that farmers can um, pinpoint the actions that need to be taken or that will be best suited for their um, location. How does that work for the farmer? Usually the farmer... Uh... I mean, there are certain farmers who are really uh, agronomic driven, but most of them, they just uh, want straight decisions. So we work a lot with agronomists or the technical departments of the large uh, agronomy, uh, agronomy farm companies, farm corporations, and uh, we train them to really 
what actually train is we share everything we have learned on this biological dimension with them so they can take action out of the results that we deliver. Okay, usually they come with a specific question. This area is, uh, the yield of this area is lower than this other area and I'm doing exactly the same. Why is that? So this is one of the most frequent questions. In that case, you just do a comparative analysis, compare the functional profiles, and then it's like, oh, this is what is dri driven, driving that uh, in this area you have a lower performance of the crop. So now you need to unlock that. Usually we work with agronomists and because this is new for them. I mean, in the agronomic schools, this dimension was not so developed till now. And now they are starting to, to get some, some learnings. But uh, the people who is already on the field, they need to, to learn. And they are really happy to learn because that qualified them. So we work a lot with agronomists. And we have this community called Soil Squad, where we also allow them to exchange information and data. Because if you have already experienced a situation, it's likely that other has, uh, is going to have the same problem. So in the moment they face this, that problem, I mean, they don't need to do it. Crowd knowledge, I mean, we need to do that. We're doing that in all dimensions. We need to apply that in agriculture for sure. Absolutely. And for the future of what you're doing, have you got anything um, in the pipeline that's new or is it all very much a case of keep expanding on these databases and the information that you were understanding? Well, I already talked about this uh, AI or virtual assistant for agronomists. So we want to really upgrade the tools that we provide and not just give them the functional profile, but really narrow down to the conclusions. And what is more interesting, uh, narrow down to what could be the specific uh, solution that they need to apply. And this is something we're working and it's going to be available probably by the end of the year for certain crops. This is progressively. And uh, another thing we are really excited about, it's about uh, a new service based on the same technology where we make an overall assessment on the sustainability of the farm by looking at the soil. No, again, so it's the bioindicator. And this is closely connected to the carbon sequestration activity. And uh, there we have really nice, we're doing different experiments to really, I mean, any, any service, any uh, technology that we put into the market, we want to feel confidence that it has been properly validated, is trustable and is reliable. And that's the reason because we have so many PhDs in our company and we publish so many scientific papers as well because we really like talk to the academia, get the exposure, get their feedback. And uh, with that, it's called Big Crop Rate. It's already available, but the connection with the carbon is to come. We're finishing certain projects to really make those connections between the different scores that the farm gets with the level of carbon sequestration that they have. Once we have that, then we'll have a reliable measure or metric on the carbon sequestration activity in the field. That sounds very significant because like we've said before, it's going to tie things back to the carbon credits and maybe make things more accessible if that validation process is ticked. So yeah, this sounds like incredibly important stuff. Um, Hopefully. <laughs> and from the consumer's point of view, because we've talked a lot about um, information that's very, very valuable and um, relevant to farmers, but this is all relevant to consumers because we're talking about food supply. So this is a you know stability of prices and availability of food on the shelf. It also has um, potentially a big impact upon nutritional value of food too, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, but I will go a little beyond the nutritional value. I mean, for sure, uh, I, there are certain dimensions from nutrition that we, are, we were not considering. And uh, for instance, uh, when you are having an organic apple versus a conventional apple, uh, from the nutritional point of view, you might be getting more or less the same. But if you think about the inoculum that you are getting, probably it's going to be different. Actually, we have a project that we did with a, a really nice corporation in U.S. comparing conventional apples with the organic apples, comparing what is the diversity, the microbial diversity in the apple. So when you purchase it, and what we realize is that the 
the load of microbes were completely different. Conventional apples were uh, had less uh, diversity and organic apples uh, bigger diversity. And then the question is, okay, is that that does it mean that organic apples are better or worse than conventional apples? No, that's the wrong question. The question is, if you need to buy apples for a hospital where people is recovering and the immune system is very low, you don't want to feed them with organic apples because in, in higher biodiversity means that you also have some pathogens. Remember when we talk about the balance, so you don't want to put uh, any threat, any additional threat on those patients. But if you need to buy apples to for a school where, with children who need to develop the immune system, probably you want to feed them with organic apples because that's going to help the immune system to fight against uh, those microbes and so on. So this is what is important for consumers, having qualified information and uh, trying to make more uh, qualified decisions on what they are eating. There are decisions on nutrition, there are decisions on sustainability, and there are plenty of organic labels or sustainable labels in, in the crops that most of the consumers don't really know what is behind. And if you think about organic certifications, most of the certificates, sometimes those certifications are not as meaningful as consumer things. So probably we need a little bit more detail. And data society, you know, I, I really love data. And so uh, everybody has access to information. So what we need is to be sure that the information flows in the in the right way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We've got so much new information coming out so quickly that this is a very, very significant time, I think, for for finding ways that we can connect that to every every person around society, whether they're the consumer or the grower or um, the scientist. So it's incredibly, incredibly important work that you're doing. And I think it, it, it ties into so many different areas. And probably I could talk about this all day because you've got got so much going on but I just want to um, thank you for joining me it's been very very interesting very informative and if you've got anything else that you'd like to share before we we part ways now I really appreciate the opportunity to share uh, well what we are doing uh, and really appreciate that you're doing all these communication activities to make people aware of everything that is happening in, in the world related to carbon, related to agriculture, and all the opportunities. So thank you, Helen, for inviting us, and it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And we'll share your website and information as well with people so that they can continue to research and have a look into everything that you're doing. And thank you for listening to this episode of We Are Carbon. Next time, we'll be joined by Michelle Gilman and her startup, Food Fluency. We've heard a lot about the huge significance that regenerative farming can have on improving the health of the planet. And so we're tipping the focus in this discussion to explore the role of farming and our food systems upon our own personal health. You can keep up to date with everything from We Are Carbon by subscribing on the website or following along on Instagram. Search for wearecarbon.earth. And let's keep figuring this all out together.